start our STC with the first lecture of the day. And uh, the first lecture of the day will be uh, delivered by a very, very young erudite scholar, Dr. Basudara Roy, on uh, the topic Cultural Studies, Key Concepts, Part 1. And uh, uh, Basudra, as you all know, uh, some of you all know, and uh, for those who are uh, new today, joinees, uh, she has been an excellent scholar right from her uh, uh, college days. Uh, she has been awarded with gold medals both uh, in her and undergraduate and postgraduate level in Banaras Hindu University. And she is also a recipient of Junior Research Fellowship uh, for her academic excellence. And uh, Presently, she is teaching as assistant professor in the Department of English at uh, Karim City College, uh, Jamshedpur in Jharkhand. And uh, she al already has a teaching experience of a decade now. Uh, Basudra's uh, area of academic interest are diaspora writing, women's writing, cultural studies, gender studies, and postmodern criticism. And uh, her research articles and book reviews have been widely, uh, they have appeared in reputed academic journals across the country and across as book chapters in, in, in books. Uh, she's a very, very uh, erudite, budding, uh, young poetess uh, who has done a considerable uh, work in the field of uh, poetry writing. The testimony to that fact is uh, her recently published a book of poems uh, titled Moon in My Teacup by uh, the famous uh, Kolkata Writers uh, Workshop in 2019, which has received a very, very uh, positive response from the world of academia. She also has a credit to one more uh, monograph to her credit. Uh, that monograph, that book's title, which she published in 2019 with Atlantic Publisher is uh, Migrations of Hope, a study of the short fiction of three Indian American uh, writers. Dr. Basudara Roy, as always, has been the pleasure uh, um, of me hosting you today itself also is a great pleasure to have you and thank you so much for accepting our invitation and thank you for being the first speaker of this uh, uh, ambitious STC uh, on cultural studies. The platform is all yours now, Basu. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Sekhanda. And uh, this is wonderful uh, coming here uh, again for uh, your That Voyage Journal uh, and for your uh, wonderful participants. So thank you, thank you for having me here. And uh, I have been given this uh, quite challenging task of uh, giving the first uh, lecture for this uh, cultural studies uh, short-term course. Uh, though our uh, the, the way that the syllabus has been divided is quite well defined. Uh, still being the first speaker kind of makes it mandatory that I introduce the discipline of cultural studies to you as if you know you knew nothing about it. So welcome, welcome all of you to this uh, first session. And uh, my I was supposed to deal with key concepts. So today's the two lectures that you will be hearing today would be on the key concepts of cultural studies. And I was supposed to be dealing with a few key concepts. I have uh, taken the liberty to title my presentation as Negotiating Culture in Cultural Studies. So we are going to talk about what cultural studies is all about, uh, how do you formulate cultural studies as an academic discipline, and I would also be talking about the formative influence. We would be talking about the Victorian period and how you know the dominant ideas of the Victorian intellectuals went a long way to shape the discipline that we know today as cultural studies. So these would be the primary objectives of my presentation. Uh, at the very outset, I must tell you that I have been a little uh, caught up with other things because of which this PowerPoint, you know, would stop midway in the sense that it would not be able to talk about the PowerPoint would not be able to talk about the Victorian intellectuals in a written format. But I hope that I will be able to accompany uh, this or without the company of this, I hope I will be able to do justice to the ideas that need to be discussed today. So welcome once again and let us talk about negotiating culture and cultural studies.
Yes. So what exactly is cultural studies? Now, this is a term we see that has gained wide popularity and almost everybody would have it in his or her academic CV that they enjoy cultural studies, they prefer cultural studies, they are specialized in cultural studies. Now, it is very easy to say that we are specialists in cultural studies because you realize that cultural studies is an umbrella, not even an umbrella term, I would call it a blanket term, you know. Cultural studies is a blanket term that uh, applies itself to a host of critical practices. So let us see, we see that cultural studies is, uh, the, 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 this definition particularly, I have taken from uh, Peter Child's Dictionary of Literary Terms by Peter Child and Roger Fowler, the Rutil Edge Dictionary of Literary Terms. What I liked about, the, I, uh, about this definition is that they call cultural studies abroad and a generally unhelpful appellation given to an amorphous body of critical practices, right? So the terms that I would like to draw your attention to would be unhelpful. Cultural studies as a term is quite unhelpful because it does not tell us exactly what to expect. So when you compare cultural criticism to terms like feminist criticism or Marxist criticism or psychoanalytic criticism, you know what to expect. So you know that feminist criticism is going to talk about gender. You know that Marxist criticism is going to talk about class, that psychoanalyst criticism will talk about uh, you know, the mind. Uh, you realize that you are clueless when you enter the world of cultural studies. So if this, if something, you know, is going to give you a cultural studies perspective on something else, you really do not know what to expect. So to begin with, let me emphasize the fact that cultural studies is a blanket term, rather unhelpful, which applies, which extends to an amorphous body of critical practices. Amorphous, not at all well-defined. And the notion is that it concerns itself with culture. And that would, of course, bring us later to the idea of what culture is. As a field that emerged during the late uh, 1950s across the English-speaking world, and we find that it tends to gravitate towards what we understand as expressions of popular culture. So you realize that the term popular culture, you know, and this is what today I will try to uh, bring about through my discussion is that popular culture began as a pejorative term. It began as a derogatory term, uh, particularly if you take into account the Victorian period, if you take into account the idea of Arnold and then T.S. Eliot, F.R. Nevis, you realize that popular culture was a term that applied to the culture of the masses, the masses which Matthew Arnold called the Philistines. However, cultural studies has taken up this uh, pejorative term uh, and it has empowered it by applying it to the galaxy of uh, practices that we today call cultural. So cult cultural studies has, as I said, gravitated towards expressions of popular culture, general culture, the culture of the common people, the culture of the masses, or of the Philistines in Arnold's term. Though cultural studies frequently emerged out of academic departments of English literature, it has often been very, very critical of the practice in academia. So cultural studies, though it has emerged out of academia, it is quite critical of academic practices. It is quite critical of the ideas which go into the shaping of what the academia calls the literary canon or what the academia calls, you know, uh, culture, culture within inverted commas. So though you see uh, it is the English departments across the world which have been the crucible of the development and formation of the key ideas of cultural studies, we realize that cultural studies has forever retained a critical stance towards these academic ideas and these academic programs. Uh, which try to establish a conservative dominance on what they decide as the literary canon. Where 
English literature explicitly suggested, uh, you know, an ideologically driven hierarchy of cultural production. Cultural studies had focused attention on the mass culture. The key word here would be mass culture, as I said, the popular culture or the mass culture. So whereas, you know, the English departments in various uh, colleges would focus, would try to talk about uh, a cultural hierarchy of, you know, which work is at the top and which practices at the top and which works should be read. Uh, the idea of sublimity, the idea of, uh, you know, impersonality. So all these ideas uh, have been built and popularized by academia. Cultural studies within academia has tried to embrace a minority perspective. It has tried to make the minority the majority. So it has focused attention on mass culture. It has taken up randomly, you know, as its subjects newspapers, magazines, popular literary genres such as the romance, detective fiction, television, film, advertising, and so on. So there is nothing you know which is outside the purview of what we would call culture and therefore what we would call cultural studies. Uh, so you realize that uh, culture is a broad term. It has extended uh, it, it means many things, but broadly cultural studies identified culture as the reflection of a society's idiosyncratic character. Every society, every population mass, every social group would have, you know, an idiosyncratic set of characteristics that would serve to define it. And this had been initially the target and the focus of cultural studies to take up those uh, ideas or those patterns of behavior that reflected the society's idiosyncratic character. And this would include all forms of cultural as well as subcultural expressions. Today, cultural studies is an exciting field. It has become the rage amongst progressives. And in general, you know, everything today is replaced by the idea of culture. So it has made its presence felt in the academic world, in all disciplines across academia, whether it is in the humanities or the social sciences, even in the sciences and technologies. It is, as I said, an ubiquitous term. It is everywhere and everybody everywhere is talking about cultural studies today. Now, let us look at the word cultural studies. Let us try to split it into two parts. So culture, cultural and studies. So if cultural studies, uh, like a term, as a term, you know, if it could be considered as a kin of other terms like management studies and gender studies and communication studies, uh, it would mean that studies indicates a broad field of inquiry on a subject, right? So. Uh, Gender studies would study gender, business studies would study business. Similarly, cultural studies then, if studies is a broad term of inquiry, then cultural studies would study what? Culture, of course. This is what we have been uh, driving at. And this would inevitably then bring us to the question of what is culture? Now let us take into account the fact at this very uh, point of time, let us remember that uh, what is culture has never been a very neutral question. What is culture has, I repeat, never been a neutral question because it will depend upon who is asking the question. It will also depend upon to whom the question is being asked. So what is culture? Who has the right to identify what is culture? Who is accorded the status of offering a definition on what is culture? And this entirely has been the debate of cultural studies. And this is where cultural studies as a field continues to thrive, to survive, and to find new ways. Because culture has never been a transparent term. And uh, the definitions of culture have never been, you know, simply definitions, because you realize that in every definition, there is a sense of hierarchy built into things. There is a sense of legitimation built into things. So who has the authority, you know, to legitimize a definition uh, will always remain a important area of concern within cultural studies. So to go ahead with what is culture. So culture as a concept is notorious. It has been notorious for its ambiguity. It's very, very ambiguous. It's very difficult to concretely point our finger uh, at this and say this or this alone is culture 
or that these, 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 these are culture. It is impossible to come to an exhaustive list. Of course, culture is not one thing. And at the same time, it is very difficult to form an exhaustive list of what is culture, what constitutes culture. So for various anthropologists, culture uh, has always referred to social behavior. So some anthropologists will say that culture is social behavior, whereas there are others who will say that it is not behavior at all. It is an abstraction from behavior. So debates have always existed. They continue to exist. Let us take into account a few definitions of culture, a few popular and short, simple definitions that I randomly picked up. Uh, there is uh, there is no uh, there, uh, there is no uh, theoretical element at work in my choice. Uh, it has randomly been taken up. So I begin with the very common, very popular, very well-known definition of culture, which was advanced by, it's one of the earliest definitions, which was advanced by the British anthropologist C.B. Tyler in his book, Primitive Cultures. And he says that culture is that complex whole, which includes knowledge of belief, art, morals, law, customs, and other capabilities and habits acquired by man as a member of society. I ask you to focus on the last portion of the definition. So all these things which are acquired by man as a member of society. Two things stand out here. First is that culture is acquired. It is not inherited. It is not built into our genes. It is something that we acquire. So this acquisition would naturally be from the environment. So if you are reminded of you know, the tempest and you are reminded of Prospero and the way that they tried to culture Caliban and in their, uh, as they saw it, their culturing of Caliban was defeated because Calib Caliban's inherent nature had something in that which would not take the print of civil Civilization. That was what Prospero said. So you realize that this nature nurture debate has forever existed. We can locate it as far back as Shakespeare and even further back when you go to Plato and Aristotle, it has always been there. So my idea is to, is to uh, just remind you that uh, culture, when we are talking about culture, we are talking about something which is acquired, something that we are not born with, something which is not inherent uh, to our um, biological framework or to our genetic composition. Again, culture is something which is acquired as a member of society. This social dimension is also very important when we, when we talk about culture. So culture is not or cannot be understood by the practices of a single individual. A single individual would not, you know, be understood as a cultural unit. So the unit of culture has to be the society and it is the individual as a member of the society uh, from whom, you know, we can gather cultural data. So it is important that we take these two things into account. So, for example, if we were to study, you know, Rudyard Kipling's uh, Mowgli, and if we were to look at Mowgli, and if we were to try to understand Mowgli's culture, uh, we would be very hard put to apply to human society or apply to Mowgli what we have garnered from human societies or human behavior because Mowgli lives in a different culture altogether. He may be a man, he may be a boy, but he belongs to a different culture altogether and that is uh, again, a variety of cultures. In, in general, we will call it the jungle culture, you know, and repeatedly in the Disney uh, adaptations, you will always, they will always say jungle ka kanun, hmm? this is the law of the jungle. So in general, you could contrast this with the jungle culture, but then within the jungle also, you will have these different groups which have their own subcultures. So it is important that uh, we understand culture as something which is acquired and something which is contextual, something which is absorbed as uh, being a member of a larger society. So it is the individual within society who can always be considered as a cultural unit. Uh, we move ahead and there is the American anthropologist Margaret Mead who says that culture is the learned behavior of a, uh, the learned, sorry, not learned, it's the learned behavior of a society or subgroup. So culture is the learned behavior. Again, you know, acquired, learned. This is the word that you will find repeated often again in definitions of culture. So it is not something that we are born with. It is something that we learn. And naturally, when the idea of acquisition or learning comes in, the idea of the model also comes in. 
whom do you learn from who is your model who will teach you what you should learn who will decide what is to be learned these are all questions that are continuously you know playing hide and seek behind these definitions and the fact that cultural studies is so plural it emerges from these various responses to these various questions so if culture is learned behavior who are we learning from uh, what are we learning is secondary who are we learning from is primary and entirely we find that within cultural studies there has been a debate about establishing a center for culture so uh, and cultural studies is against the notion of the center so all these ideas are here and they are uh, conflicting with one another to give us very rich and very uh, you know uh, unlimited unlimited possibilities for cultural studies there is clifford geets who says that culture is simply the ensemble of the stories that we tell ourselves about ourselves so clifford geets is certainly coming in later later than tyler and mead and look at the way he defines culture so it is the stories that we tell ourselves about ourselves again look at the plurality here it's ourselves it's not ourself it is selves so we we assume that there is a society to talk to there is a community or a group at least to talk to so it is the stories that we tell ourselves as a community and these are stories about ourselves so here there is no notion of learning it is a notion of communication it is a notion of knowing understanding oneself and again the idea of the story which indicates that culture is a narrative it is a story finally that we tell ourselves and there is no legitimacy behind it nobody can verify your story and nobody has the authority to verify your story and say what is right and what is wrong so it is simply a story it is simply a narrative which was my idea in including this last definition uh we go ahead and so one cursory glance at these definitions will suffice it will be sufficient to convey to you the impression that culture means everything there is nothing outside the ambit or the purview of culture so culture means everything what we eat what we drink the way we talk what we wear uh, how we communicate with whom uh, the patterns in which we live the patterns of housing the patterns of leisure everything is covered by culture and cultural studies would thereby imply the study of everything so if culture is everything cultural studies would mean the study of everything cultural studies thus it must be understood does not speak with one voice and it cannot be spoken with one voice i want to harp upon this that you cannot expect one singular uh, you know one singular face for cultural studies one singular voice for cultural studies because it is not single it is it exists in plurality and therefore it has to be spoken about it has to be discussed it has to be represented in all its plurality not surprisingly therefore cultural studies does not have a clearly defined subject area its starting point is a very broad and a very inclusive notion of culture that is used to describe and convey a whole range of practices in fact there are many critics who have pointed out that the term you know cultural studies if we look at it from the structuralist point of view and we believe that every term is a signifier and it has a signified so you realize that the cultural the term cultural studies has no signified it has no referent uh, to which we can point and say that this is cultural studies no Uh, there are a host of things which would always qualify and which have always qualified for coming under this blanket term so it is a continuously expanding discipline that emerges from a range of interdisciplinary and continually changing ideas so i my uh, conclusion here is that cultural studies rather than being something that is is something we do so let us move uh, you know let us move the, or let us shift uh, our vision towards uh, not uh, the theory of cultural studies but towards the practice because we realize that cultural studies is being redefined is being re uh, is being rewritten every day through new practices of cultural studies so rather than a uh, finding or rather than focusing on one fixed definition or idea of what cultural studies is or is supposed to do we must realize that cultural studies is something that we do 
something that we practice. So cultural studies rather than a theory should be understood as a practice. Of course, it works with theories. It will continuously juggle with theories, not with one, but with a range of theories altogether. And uh, this juggling, this mixing and matching of theories that we bring into the project of doing cultural studies will lead to further widenings of the framework with the result that you will have added new dimensions to cultural studies with every new study that you do. So uh, I would uh, stop this idea at this point that cultural studies is something that we do rather than something that is exists predefined. Okay, so if cultural studies is everything, everything is culture, and every study related to culture is cultural studies, then it would be very difficult for us to exactly understand what cultural studies is. So if it is everything, it would be nothing. So there would be a danger of cultural studies losing its identity if we entirely refrain from a theoretical categorization. So if we say that, no, we, we cannot define it or we refuse to define it, uh, it will, it may be so uh, amorphous that it will cease to exist altogether. So though, you know, it is difficult to uh, actually pinpoint and uh, to actually demarcate the boundaries of cultural studies, we have to broadly understand that not everything is cultural studies. There are many disciplines which are undertaking and which have been undertaking studies of culture, but not all these things would qualify to be called cultural studies. So we have to understand that cultural studies is not, for instance, physics, it is not political science, it is not sociology, it is not linguistics, though it draws upon these subject areas. These areas have contributed theories and theorists to the and tools to the uh, understanding of cultural studies. However, you know, cultural studies is not this. Indeed, there must be, as Stuart Hall argues, something in cultural studies that differentiates it from other subjects. What is it in cultural studies that would differentiate, that would set it apart from other disciplines? Which, of course, brings us to ask what broadly are the concerns of cultural studies? We can only talk about it broadly uh, at a bird's eye view because, uh, as I said, it is so multiple, it is so plural, it is such a blanket term that we cannot do an intricate analysis. But broadly, all cultural theorists would agree that they have certain ideas which they want to bring out in their study of culture. So fine, they are studying culture, fine that everything is culture, but what exactly are cultural critics doing which is different from what other critics are doing? So here we go. Number one, I believe that the most significant difference uh, that cultural studies or let us, if, let us not call it difference, let us call it a characteristic or an idea, the central, one of the central ideas within cultural studies is that it seeks to establish connections between culture and politics. It is not studying culture merely for the sake of it. It is not studying culture merely to amass objective knowledge. Uh, to amass, uh, you know, theoretical knowledge. It is studying culture for practical purposes and its aim is to link the study of culture to the matters of politics or cultural politics. So we have to understand that cultural studies seeks to maintain a connection between matters of power and cultural politics. It's a body of theory generated by thinkers who regard the production of theoretical knowledge as a political practice. So this knowledge is not being acquired for its own sake. We are not studying a particular community or a particular cultural artifact or a particular cultural process or a cultural institution merely because they want objective knowledge. No, they are doing it so that they can understand, you know, how the knowledge of this particular cultural practice will enable them to talk about the politics of culture prevailing in society as a whole. How does this culture negotiate with politics and how can politics negotiate with culture? So here, knowledge is never a neutral or objective phenomenon. It is always a matter of positionality. That is another idea that we must understand when we are doing cultural studies. We are talking about intersection. Uh, we are talking about interdisciplinary ideas. We are also talking about positionality because everybody, every onlooker upon culture would view cultural processes 
from his or her own position. So it is not only about perspective. So far in literary theory, we have been harping upon perspective. So here we talk about position. What position are you in? And what privilege do you have? The insider outsider status. All these ideas, you know, will help us understand uh, that what we are looking at is also from where we are looking at, is also how we are looking at. All these questions would be interrelated. So that we already begin with the idea that no knowledge of culture could be objective. Every knowledge will always be partial because it will always be positional and because it will always be limited. So we begin with the assumption that cultural studies, the study of culture is not undertaken by cultural studies purely uh, because we want to be connoisseurs of knowledge. No, because we are interested in the politics of culture, in how culture expresses itself through politics and how politics expresses itself through culture. Again, cultural studies as an institutional location. So we have to understand that uh, there are a host of disciplines that deal with culture. So sociology will also deal with culture. Anthropology will also deal with culture. Literature in its various aspects. Geography will also deal about culture. However, the cultural forays of these disciplines uh, will not be counted upon or will not be looked upon as cultural studies. So this uh, sociology or anthropology or literature, even when they deal with culture, will remain sociology and anthropology and literature. In order for it to become cultural studies, you know, it has to adopt a different set of tools and methodologies. So cultural studies, we have to understand, is a discursive formation. It has its own institutional location. It is a regulated way of speaking about objects, and it will always you know, move around certain key concepts, ideas, concerns, which is why this starting formative lecture on key concepts becomes important. We must know what we are looking for when we are dealing with cultural studies. Further, we have to understand that cultural studies had a moment in which it's named itself. So it is a self-stylized name that this movement has given itself. So it is a name that it has given itself, uh, though we have to understand that this name will always have its limitations because cultural studies and culture in cultural studies will always have its limitations. It will always be a snapshot of a particular time. Uh, you can always look back from here and it is very difficult to look front, to look ahead from here. So uh, culture is an ever evolving project. It, it has been evolving and it will hopefully continue to evolve and thrive. So though what we call cultural studies is, is talking about, it, it is about looking at the present as also the past, it is equally about looking at the future. So we have to understand that though cultural studies is a very broad, is a very amorphous, is a blanket term, not everything is cultural studies. It has its institutional location and therefore its own theoretical tools, practices and motives. So broadly, if we try to understand uh, the disciplinary boundaries of cultural studies, what would be the disciplinary boundaries? So cultural studies is an interdisciplinary field in which perspectives from different disciplines can be selectively drawn to examine the relationship between culture and power. So this is the first thing that we said we are doing. We are not looking at culture just for the sake of culture itself. We are looking at culture as an expression of power and as an entanglement and investment in power. So to, in order to do this, we can draw from a range of interdisciplinary perspectives, selectively, of course, in order to establish our point of view. It is concerned with all those practices, institutional systems of classification through which there is inculcated in the population particular values, competencies, routine of life, uh, habits, conduct. So cultural studies is about politics and how does it examine politics and power? It is examining it through culture. And what is culture? So culture is a set of practices, institutions, systems, which have emerged you know, from the values and ideas of a people, of a society, of a group. The forms of power that cultural studies explores are diverse. So it can look at various categories of power, various diversifications of power. So gender, race, class, colonialism, etc., would all be vital categories of power that cultural studies can be concerned with. 
It is here to explore the connections between these forms of power and to develop ways of thinking about culture and power that are utilized by agents in the pursuit of change. The prime institutional sites for cultural studies are uh, higher education institutions. And cultural studies has always emerged, has mostly emerged from these academic disciplines. Nevertheless, it tries to forge connections outside the academia also with social, political, uh, economic movements. And it has also, you know, retained a very, very critical stance towards uh, academic projects and academic uh, uh, you know, academic ways in which knowledge is theorized. So academic theorizations of knowledge, though uh, cultural studies emerges from academia, it has retained its critical stance towards academic theorizations. Again, the Center for Contemporary Cultural Studies. Now, though cultural studies has always been very reluctant, uh, you know, to have an institutional legitimation, yet we have to understand that the formation and the establishment of the Contemporary Cultural Studies Center in the 1960s at Birmingham University was very crucial for the development of cultural studies. Since that time, you know, it has established itself as a proper discipline, as a formal discipline. And this institution has done a lot to propagate the ideas and the practices of cultural studies. And today, today we have cultural studies departments in almost uh, in, in every corner of the world. Uh, and you have these broad groups in USA, in Australia, Africa, America, Europe, and India also, which are looking at the formations of culture in their own ways, according to their own uh, geographical histories and their cultural histories. So uh, though cultural studies has diversified and every group will have its own way of identifying with the movement, yet we realize that somehow the British establishment of uh, this contemporary cultural studies, this establishment went a long way to promote cultural studies as a theoretical field. Now we come to the key concepts in cultural studies. Uh, so. These are concepts that we are very well aware of because of our engagement with critical theory. So uh, the first idea that cultural study certainly makes use of is the idea of language and culture as being signifying systems. So we are aware that uh, structuralism looks upon things as, uh, as you know, as science systems. So it, it, it takes up the idea of uh, language and culture as being part of the semiotic system of science. And they believe that language is not just a neutral medium through which you express meaning. Uh, and th there are these constructions and these formations within language. So cultural studies has argued uh, that language is not a neutral medium. And uh, there is, uh, you know, this, this, the, the, it, is, it has doubted the possibility of a knowledge which exists outside language. Rather, it is constitutive of those very meanings and knowledge. Uh, and language gives meaning to material objects, social practices. So uh, basically, cultural studies borrows heavily from the work of Sussior and Derrida. Uh, and it, it uses these ideas to talk about culture in the same way that Sussior and Derrida talked about language and to establish you know, culture as a science system and uh, to study the science system for its power politics. This has been one central concern uh, within cultural studies. The second is representation. Cultural studies talks about the idea of representation. What is the representation? Uh, who is representing? And what are the ways in which these representations are taking place? So a good deal of cultural studies is centered on questions of representation. That is how the world is socially constructed and represented to us in various ways. Indeed, the central strand of cultural studies can be understood as this idea of representation as a signifying practice. So this requires us to explore the textual generation of meaning. It demands us to investigate the various ways in which meaning is produced in various con contexts. And representation is something that is examined, as I said, broadly in, in, in every cultural context. So whether it is literature or cinema or theater or advertisement or uh, you know, religious rituals, uh, the practice of cultural studies to understand and to codify uh, representation can, uh, can go ahead, can move on in any field. Materialism. So cultural studies believes that uh, you know, culture is not independent of materiality. So this it borrows from Marxism. 
uh, it, it borrows uh, from the uh, uh, you know base superstructure model of the Marxist idea that uh, there is uh, you cannot have a reality you cannot have uh, a cultural reality which is independent of the base economic realities so it has borrowed heavily from the Marxist idea to understand that culture will forever be rooted in materialistic practices in studies of politics and economy and uh, so on and uh, so this discipline is concerned with power and the distribution of economic and social resources so cultural studies in accordance with marxism has tried to understand this who owns and who controls cultural production so who is producing and who is controlling the production as i said who is representing and what are the ways in which representation is taking place who is uh, who is uh, you know making money out of these representations the consequences of patterns of ownership and control for contours of the cultural landscape. So uh, materialism and the, the materialist definition or understanding of culture is very basic to cultural studies. It understands that culture does not exist in vacuum. It does not exist apart from the multiple economic and social processes which underlie it. And therefore, any study of culture cannot take place without taking into account this materialistic world underneath it. At the same time, uh, it refuses, you know, Marxism's reductionism. So whereas Marxism tries to reduce everything to class, they will bring everything usual studies has refused to do. So it accepts the materialistic principle of uh, Marx or of Marxism, let us say, but it, it, it tries to move away from the reductionist stance of Marxism. So it says that, you know, though uh, culture will have always its specific materialistic investment, yet uh, we cannot reduce it to economics alone. Culture will always and always be more than economics. So in particular, cultural studies has waged a battle against economic reductionism. That is the attitude that uh, you can explain a cultural text by referring it to its place in the production process. So this is something that cultural studies has refused. So for cultural studies, the processes of political economy do not determine the meanings of the text or their appropriate aud audiences. So uh, the non-reductionism of cultural studies insists that other things apart from uh, class, you know, that is gender, sexuality, race, all these things matter uh, in a cultural production. So it is not just class and class alone, though economic interests are certainly very significant. So materialism combined with non-reductionism. Again, articulation. So culture is, is it, it does not just exist, it has to be articulated. What does articulation mean? So articulation means expression. Articulation means saying. Articulation means making a statement. So cultural studies has deployed the concept of articulation in order to theorize the relationships between the components of a social form. So it can, it can articulate, you know, culture can be articulated in a myriad ways. And this articulation again can be studied in many ways. And all of these ways, you know, through which culture is articulated or culture is studied, they are contingent. They are context specific. They're not universal. So for example, you can, uh, you can understand a particular a geographical body such as the nation as, as a gender body. So you can look upon the nation as, as, a, as a woman. Uh, you can similarly, you know, employ other uh, metaphors which would cross uh, theoretical disciplines. So all these things can be done with cultural studies uh, because it is open, you know, to being articulated, to being implicated, to being generated uh, in new ways. So the concept of articulation is also discussing the relationship uh, between culture and political economy. And it refuses to accept, you know, that culture is determined by any one thing. So it, it is non-reductive, as we have mentioned. It, it insists that culture is not determined by any one thing. Uh, we move ahead. Uh, power. Now, this is something that we have been discussing from the very beginning. And uh, so cultural studies is, of course, concerned about power. It is one of the significant areas, uh, significant concerns within cultural studies that it agrees on the centrality of power uh, within the discipline. So for most cultural study writers, power is regarded as pervading every level of socioeconomic political relationships. Power is not simply the glue that holds the society together, but it is also a very coercive force which subordinates one set of people to another. 
And uh, it, it is also understood in terms of processes that generate and enable any form of social relationship or order. So we have to understand that the entire process of subordination, uh, the process of hegemony, the, process, the, the, the idea of ideology, hegemony, would all come under the study of power. And these are ideas that we are conversant with as such. And this would be the point where my PPT will uh, you know, end and it will uh, leave you. But uh, fortunately, I'm not going to leave you. So uh, cultural studies also concerns itself as uh, mentioned at the beginning with popular culture. So it, it believes that popular culture is the ground where, you know, the consent has to be won, where, you know, people have to respond to culture uh, within the sphere, within the crucible of popular culture. So cultural studies has commonly understood popular culture to be the ground on which this consent is to be won or lost as a way of grasping the interplay of power and consent to related uh, ideas repeatedly deployed in cultural studies. Uh, just so the idea of ideology or hegemony will all be related and these are terms that we know and we will also discuss in the process and I'm sure uh, in, in the subsequent lectures also these are terms that will be coming into play and because my presentation will end here I would like you to have a glimpse of the uh, books that would be very good introductory books on cultural studies so these are five books that I have used myself uh, for my students also in my various classes and these are wonderful books you can get hold of them uh, and that would be good and uh, this is where the presentation will end however however i will i will stop sharing my screen so that i can talk to all of you uh, yes so what we have to understand so this this uh, in the ppt what i was trying to do was i was trying to outline you know uh, cultural studies as a discipline. We were trying to see what is meant by cultural studies and uh, uh, how do we try to define culture and what do we do with culture within cultural studies. Now, when we look at, uh, you know, when we look at the discipline, you realize that culture will have, that there is no point at which we can say that the study of culture as such begins. So there is no specific point where we can say that this is where it begins. Because if we mention a definite beginning, if we chalk out something as definite as a beginning, you know, we will be ruling out the other beginnings. We will be ruling out history. So we cannot do that. However, you know, for cultural studies, it is, uh, we consider it good or we consider it fertile to begin from the Victorian period onwards. Now, when you look at the Victorian period, you certainly realize that the Victorian age is the age when uh, modernism begins to set in. Although, you know, and there is a lot of fuzziness about these definitions, uh, romanticism and, uh, you know, Victorian and modern. There is such a lot of fuzziness that now in history, we are trying to talk about moving away from the age model, moving away from the chronological time model. So when we look at it culturally, in a cultural spirit, you realize that all the basic ideas that were to fuel modernism have already, you know, begun to take shape in the Victorian period. The Victorian period, which is uh, just a second, just a second, if there is a sound problem. Yes, thank you, thank you. Yes, so you realize that all the ideas that were to define modernism have already begun to take shape in the Victorian period. So the Victorian period, which was largely experiencing what we call the flip side or the underside of the Industrial Revolution, and of course, of the Enlightenment ideology, we realize that the Victorian period was one age when perhaps, and it, it, it is not, it is not, uh, you know, uh, that uh, the other ages were not concerned with studies or with questions of culture. But the Victorian period is the first age that is self-consciously concerned about culture. 
So when you try to analyze, when you try to look at the uh, output of the Victorian writers, you will realize that the word culture features so many times in the writings of the Victorians. So it is not as if the other ages were not culture conscious, but it is almost as if you know that the Victorians were self consciously conscious of culture. So you look at uh, you know John Ruskin, who says who says that the word zidgist. Uh, I would I would like the, the spirit of the age, right? The word zidgist or the spirit of the age is perhaps the word that has been used for the first time in the Victorian period. That is uh, what John Ruskin says. So John Ruskin says that I believe that uh, the spirit of the age is a term that has never been used before. Now, it, it is not as if it has never been used before, but you realize that it is the Victorian who is very self-conscious of the term. It is in the Victorian period that for the first time there is a search to uh, you know, to find out something which would unite people. Because already you realize that the Victorian age begins with the split from religion. So religion is not there for the Victorians, or it, it is not as credibly there as it was for the ages before them. So Darwin's Origin of the Species has been published, the idea of evolution has come in, and all these things, though they will be challenged later, you realize that the Victorian is for the first time in a decentered universe. All that decentered Entering and all that thrownness that Heidegger will talk of, you realize that the Victorian is already experiencing. So if there is no religion, religion, something which had, you know, uh, which had uh, put together people in a group, which had been a cohesive factor, which had been what you call the glue to society, you realize that that religious community is breaking because of the advent of science, because of Darwin, whatever you call it, or because it was intended to happen that way. So automatically, when the glue of religion begins to weaken, you are looking for other ways in order to forge unions. You are looking for other ways to study and look at, look at yourself. So the 18th century, the age of enlightenment had been the age when you know man would look at himself, to so know thyself, presume not God to scan. The proper study of mankind is man. So Alexander Pope has already exhorted you in the 18th century to look at yourself. And the 19th century is trying to look at itself and because it is trying to look at itself you see it is aware of all the ills that are flourishing in society so dickens will talk about ills and uh, the term used by john ruskin was spirit of the age what we call it just the spirit of the age uh, yes so you realize that uh, the victorian society is indeed looking at itself uh, you know, you realize that all these ideas, the idea of uh, the, the reform agitations, the idea for the extent, extending of uh, suffrage, the idea that uh, people, the labor force should unite under Marx. So the Victorian society is such a rich crucible for ideas of protest and resistance to come forward. So you realize that there is a splitting up of the world into so many diverse factions. And within it, there are people like Browning and uh, Tennyson and Arnold who are trying to come into grips with things. How do you forge connections between all this fragmentation that has already taken place? So fragmentation does not begin with the 19th century and with the First World War. Fragmentation already begins in the Victorian period. And in the face of such fragmentation, what do people do? How do people forge unions? And it is this search to forge a union that leads uh, a critic like Matthew Arnold, a poet and a critic, to give all the stages to poetry. So Arnold says that fine that we do not have religion, we still have poetry and therefore, you know, poetry and literature being the best of all that has been thought and said in the world will be the uh, Bible to the people. It will help people decide and take all decisions, you know, uh, which religion had hitherto helped us uh, take. So religion could very well be supplanted by literature and he raises literature to the level of religion. And then if, literature and religion are to be equated, then certainly the born boundaries and borders of literature will need as much policing as the borders of religion. So the borders of literature have to be policed. And if the borders of literature have to be policed, it means that we make quite clear cut statements about what is good literature, what is not. Who is the writer and who is, as Matthew Arnold says, the charlatan. 
We cannot allow anybody to enter into the realm of literature because now literature has a very, very special and sacred function to perform in Victorian society. It is supposed to replace religion. It is supposed to replace God. So if literature is supposed to be as serious and as elevated as that, its boundaries have to be policed. How do you police its boundaries? Automatically, you have to form clear cut distinctions between what is good writing and what is not. Matthew Arnold, for his own part, devises the touchstone method. So he says, I give you the touchstone method. So if, if this is fine, this is fine. If these lines, you know, uh, which you remember from a great text like Homer or Iliad or Milton, you apply these lines to another text and see if, you know, they, they bring to you the same element of sublimity of transport. He's also referring to Longinus here. So Matthew Arnold is one critic or is one intellectual who begins by giving literature a very significant place. And from literature, he moves on to a broader area that he begins to call culture. And in Culture and Anarchy, then, Matthew Arnold talks about how, you know, all this anarchy is being created in society because the various groups the, the workers and the women, the, the woman question, though not directly mentioned by Arnold, it is there lurking in the background because people were not very happy with the so-called woman question of the Victorian period. So they traced all these anarchic elements, the revolts, the protests, this demand for rights to the breaking of the prior culture, the former culture, which had existed before, you know, uh, industrialization. So they harp back to a pre-industrialized age. So the pre-industrialized age becomes for them the utopia where things had been fine, where things had been preserved. And now as a result of industrialization, people are leading very fragmented lives. Marx is already speaking about dehumanization, how uh, you know the, the fragmentation is taking place because of the division of labor. People are becoming automated, the alienation effect. So all these ideas are in the air when Matthew Arnold is formulating his ideas in culture and anarchy. And though culture and anarchy remains a very formative text for further discussions, because you realize that Eliot's notes on uh, culture and tradition will take off from Matthew Arnold's uh, you know, culture and anarchy. And then later on, Levis, uh, in Levis, F.R. Levis and his wife, Queenie Levis, will both trace their legacy in turn from Eliot's text. So you realize that Arnold remains, the ghost of Arnold will haunt uh, for till the first, uh, till the second world war, you know, the ghost of Arnold is always there. Now, what Arnold is doing and what Arnold has been criticized for is his conservatism. Arnold and T.S. Eliot also and F.R. Lewis also have largely had to bear the brunt of the criticism that they are very, conver uh, you know, they are very conservative and they believe they are talking of a minority culture in the sense that they believe only a very few people can know and can understand understand what culture is. And it is the duty of the rest of the populace to follow these very few people. So taken, uh, if you look at things from the perspective of the Victorian age, they were certainly trying to make an intervention. They were certainly trying to talk about ways by which people would come together, by which an integration would take place. But however, they are still ruled by the dominant classist assumptions of the uh, Victorian era. And therefore, they believe that it is only a handful of people, uh, Arnold as well as Eliot, as well as believe that it is a handful of people, you know, who will decide to, uh, who will decide because they will alone have the ability to decide what is so-called high culture and what is so-called, you know, mass culture or low culture. So the idea of high culture and low culture uh, can be distinctly seen as emerging in the works of Arnold, where Arnold says that uh, it, it is not everybody, not everybody has the capability to decide what good literature is or to decide what good culture is. So there will be a minority who will decide and it is the duty of the majority, so-called, to follow this minority. So. Arnold and Eliot and Lewis can all be criticized in the same score uh, for the same fault that they are perhaps too elitist in their notions 
of culture. We are too elitist in believing that, uh, you know, the factory system has needlessly uh, made people fans of the so-called popular American culture that was just coming in into the borders of Great Britain. So these, all these three critics were very, very critical of the American cultural practices, which was grasping the imagination of the British youth. And many of their ideas, therefore, was uh, to target these uh, American practices as mass culture and to talk about a certain British elevated culture, which would always be different and distinct from the so-called mass culture. However, we find that as you enter postmodernism, as you enter the Second World War, this is what people are talking about. They're talking about the dissolution of the difference between high culture and low culture. And we are substituting this with the idea of popular culture. And popular culture begins its journey as, as I said, a pejorative term, as a derogative term, as a negative term, but which today has been reclaimed by cultural studies to mean uh, something that is very positive, to mean something that has a wide base, to mean something that is applicable across uh, borders. Okay, so this is where I would like to conclude and I'm open to questions. Thank you, Basu, once again, uh, for, for your uh, very, very important uh, and uh, interesting delusion, uh, deliberations. Uh, now, uh, coming to the questions, uh, there are a few. And uh, because uh, this time we, we are on a uh, tight schedule, uh, we will be taking a few questions only. So the first question, uh, Dr. Basu, that I'll put across to you by one of the participants, here it goes. What are the methodologies that you suggest through which cultural studies can shed its epistemic entrapments and become more performative? Yes. So cultural studies uh, can uh, shed its and epistemic entrapments. It can become more performative. However, we have to remember one thing, you know, that there will always be uh, cultural studies will always straddle both these fears. It will straddle the arena of theory and it will also straddle the arena of practice. So cultural studies one significant discipline that will uh, that will take both. So we cannot have an entirely uh, perform because culture is already performative. If it has to be cultural studies, it has to be theoretical also. So we must always balance, you know, uh, theory with practice. And I believe that uh, cultural studies largely theoretically develops through new practices. The more new practices come in, the more you have uh, opportunities for theoretical exploration and you come up with new theoretical ideas. So we cannot have a completely, you know, performative uh, cultural studies. It will always straddle both these things. As far as the epistemic idea is concerned, I believe that we can make it more versatile. Uh, it is already very versatile and it is up to us, you know, to bring in new ideas drawn from new folds into the discipline so that uh, we can increase the polyphony of the discipline. The more voices there are in it, uh, the better, I believe, for cultural studies. Does that satisfy you? Thank you, Basu. Uh, just an information for the participants. We start the second session after a gap of 10 minutes from the first session. So please don't leave the meeting. And if you do leave the meeting, please do come in after 10 minutes. I will, I will after, the, after we end this session, I will tell you exactly when we start the second session. Uh, sorry for the interruption, Basu. Uh, the next question. Uh, this is a little uh, blunt kind of a question, but I'll try to make it a little uh, sober when when we say that cultural studies is heterogeneous in nature of course uh, it's it's a fact uh, what are we really trying to preserve in the name of culture why there is so much of fuss or anxiety about this you know great culture and heritage what's your opinion 
Exactly, exactly. This is a wonderful question. And this is basically the goal of cultural studies. It has always been and it will keep being uh, because there will be certain factions of people who will try to colonize the idea of culture. So certain people, certain groups of people will always try to decide and intervene and say what is culture, especially if this group is in power, you know, they will be radically capable of redefining a culture altogether. Now, just to give you an example, look at the way in which the holiday list, the university holiday list has been redefined and is also in the process of being redefined. So you will realize that gradually all minority festivals are being removed from the holiday list and the majority festivals are there. So what happens to an onlooker who is looking at the holiday list of an institution or of, yes, say an institution. So I look at the holiday list of an institution and I see that these are the festivals for which you know the college or the authority has decided to close down and these are and uh, and there, there is no mention of other festivals so what would be my idea of the kind of group to which the nation or to which the university caters so i will automatically come to a homogenized perception of culture when i do not see parsi festivals when i do not see muslim festivals when i do not see tribal festivals when i do not see christian festivals i will automatically believe that the nation is largely you know it does not have these groups in it so we are in a place where you know power is always trying to influence culture we are in a very very bad shape today and not only in India, but look at countries across the world. Everywhere you will find that power blocks are trying to redefine culture. And this is what had happened in the past also. So some invader comes along and decides to sabotage a particular monument because they believe that it does not suit their idea of culture. Or the, the Constantinople, the fall of Constantinople happened because the Turks thought that, okay, this had nothing to do with their culture. So we are continuously trying to lay a claim and say, this is my culture, this is your culture and we are trying to police cultural expressions not only largely in the nation look at the family look at the way gender roles are treated within the family so if if there is a, a, a boy who would rather you know uh, like to dress up like a girl and put lipstick and have long hair they are subject to ridicule because it is not supposed to be in their culture for a boy to behave like this if a man in a certain culture does not beat up his wife uh, it, it is not considered to be the sign of a good husband so a good husband good is not morally good good is strong capable so a strong man has to assert his patriarchy through verbal or physical abuse but these are all symptomatics of culture and we are trying to reshape this culture so we talk of a patriarchal culture we talk of a religious culture so we can look at culture from diverse points and at and from every point that we look at culture we will realize that there is always a police you know which tries to define what is culture what is good culture what is legitimate and what is not legitimate we are supposed to challenge this we have to make culture a place which is open for everyone where everybody is allowed to eat what they want allowed to wear what they want allowed to go wherever they want to have the same opportunities as others this is what we are trying to do look at the way food you know is being tampered with so certain cuisines are going out of fashion they are going out of restaurants they are going out of uh, you know menu cards and they will entirely lead to the disappearance of particular groups and communities does that clarify you rumi ruma i would also like to uh, put across to the participants that uh, what our resource person is uh, is meaning by uh, uh, by certain kinds of uh, festivals going out uh, please don't take into please don't have an approach of uh, you know looking into only one particular religion or one particular caste she is talking about the tribal festivals also because she hails from a tribal land she is presently uh, at the heart of a tribal uh, land, you know, and there are a lot, many, very, very rich tribal cultures also, uh, which should have a space uh, in, in, in not only the holiday list, in, uh, the, in, the, in the greater imagination. No, yes, greater. also, you know, also, I would like to add, Chef Ali, that don't look at how things stand today. Look at also the policies which are in the offing, the things which are planned, you know, for the future. So uh, 
even when you are planning to do something it does not matter that you have done it already even when you are planning to do it it shows that you have a particular notion of culture with which you are proceeding right so it is not just about what you have today it is also about what you may not have tomorrow because these things i i i i i am telling them because they are already in the offing and if you look up if you search the net you will find reasonable evidence uh, to back my claim and we are not only talking about non hindus we are also talking about hindus why not the hindus uh, festival also which are which are marginalized the even regional festivals there yes, are certain regional, festivals cycles. which are very regional people of one community will follow them in a particular region right so local festivals so we believe that for such local festivals at least the local institutions should be able to have a holiday so uh, it, it it is just an example that i'm trying to give you and of course you will find data to back this i'm sure have a look Uh, the next question vasu uh, what is the difference between representation and articulation yes representation and articulation are both you know concepts that you will come across uh, in cultural studies as such representation is talking about how things are represented for example uh, like look when we talk about the representation of women in media now representation again will be divided into two parts there would be a mainstream representation so if i say that generally women tend to be represented as uh, you know as as objects as commodities you will say that no in so and so film or in so and so ad uh, this does not take place but we are also talking about generality look at things generally so you realize that uh, you know in general for example the other day i was also telling someone that look at the advertisement for edu educational institutions this is the time of admissions so almost every university will have its banner its poster its brochure its prospectus up uh, either uh, virtually or even on hoardings in at various corners in the city and look at the students which are represented in the university so the student the general ideal representation of the student is usually a female it is usually a female student it is usually a very hip hop female you know she will be dressed in western clothes she will have a western hairstyle dyed hair and she will be 34 20 36 24 36, 36 that kind of a figure or a zero figure woman and she would be carrying a few books the number of women in the poster or the number of female students in the poster will far outnumber the number of male students this is for sure so why do we use women you know to advertise things so you have even if it is the uh, you know if it is the ad for a uh, you know a, a male deodorant or a shaving cream or a car or a sofa or furniture you know which are all unisexual products you will still have a woman in the advertisement why it is because we are in a society where we find that women are treated as objects and the advertising scenario also takes benefit of that so the media the mainstream media recently there was a lot of hula bulu about you know what to do with these uh, the negative representation of women in item numbers and this has forever been existing how many males do you find dancing to the tune of uh, item numbers in the theater in the theater on the screen whereas in reality uh, when these songs are played it is generally in male groups that these songs are played in male bars that these songs are played so the people who are dancing to the songs in reality are all men whereas the one who is performing the song on screen is always a woman why is this so there are ways in which you find that representation you know is coded so representation is this the way things are presented to you not the way things actually are but the way that they are presented to you and representation will always be challenged by representation so you can challenge one representation by offering another representation you cannot challenge representation in theory by saying that okay i i disagree to this and ideally this should be a representation i have to offer another representation to challenge that articulation by articulation we mean how we state things you know how we put together things in order to amplify them 
So to articulate means to state, right? To state and to strengthen. So we can articulate, I can articulate, for example, my ideas about representation through a range of theories. I can bring in Judith Butler's theory of performativity, and I can say that if gender is just performance, then why do we always need to have a female uh, on screen dancing, right? If gender is just performance, we can relate it to the, the, the local, you know, the, the dramas, the, the jatras, where you still have in many corners males who are playing the part of females related to Elizabethan theater. So articulation is bringing in a range of perspectives to state to strengthen my particular case, right? Whereas representation is looking at critically uh, that things which are presented are not facts. They are represented in a certain way so as to suit, you know, the profit quotient of the cultural production practices. So things are produced in a culture and this cultural production has to be questioned. Today, even tourism is produced, right? So we, we talk about we are trying to market a native flavor. This is a native cuisine. This is a native idea. This is a native uh, culture that we are trying to uh, you know, uh, offer to you. Today, we are also talking about virtual tourism. So you can sit in your homes and you will have to pay rupees 100 or rupees 200 and you will be able, you will be able to see Balaji Mandir on screen and you will be able to go to so and so park on screen. So the idea is that what are we doing here? We can also click the pictures and have a look uh, on Google. There are so many images, but we would go in for those practices which promise authenticity to us. So authenticity is again another very key term in cultural studies. What is authentic? And then who will decide what is authentic? So for example, I, I am a Bengali. Uh, I have a Bengali name. And so if I tell people something about Bengalis, people will be likely to believe me because they will believe I am a Bengali. However, the fact is I have never lived in Bengal. I have no connections in Bengal. So I have thoroughly lived in this tribal belt of Jharkhand. So my posturing as a Bengali would not be authentic. It would merely be a posture, but people would take it as authentic. So you can see that there are various ways, there are various positions from which people talk. And when we are talking about representation, we are talking about how things are coming across. When we are talking about articulation, we are talking about how to bring more ideas in order to represent this idea in a better way. Does it, uh, is it helpful? Absolutely okay. Uh, and uh, uh, very, very, uh, you know, uh, rational and reasonable answers to the questions that have been put across. Uh, so thank you once again, although you are a very important and significant mm -hmm. member of Team Dark Voyage. Uh, thank you once again for sparing your time, preparing so meticulously and coming back with a very, very uh, well-researched presentation. So on behalf of Team Dark Voyage, it was an absolute pleasure once again to host you, Basu. And uh, see you very soon uh, in some other role uh, that uh, we are planning. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank uh, you. It was a pleasure to, it's always a pleasure to be here. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you, Sekhada. Thank, Thank you, you Hariyom. Uh, please, uh, please do take care. And uh, yeah, you are free to leave the meeting uh, if you are, or sure. please, please join and uh, be in the meeting for the next lecture I if you are, if you are uh, willing. Yes, yes. You can take a break I, and come I, back. I will uh, be here. Uh, uh, Thank you, dear participants, Definitely. for joining, and thank you, Dr. Basu, once again uh, from Team Thank Bob you. Boys. Thank you. Uh, yes.